Perfect. Well, hello and welcome everybody. Thank you so much for joining us and this first Monarch Safe seminar series. Uh, we uh, asked everybody as we were launching Safe Monarchs, what do you need to be better connected and uh, more effective in your monarch conservation efforts? And one of the things that people came back with time and time again is uh, more resources, more knowledge, more time, more labor, and more networking opportunities to learn from each other. And one of the, the big useful things that has come out of Safe Monarchs are these, these toolkits that come out uh, twice a year, and they're so, so valuable. Um, and they offer a lot of that, you know, they give back in terms of labor and, and time. Um, but there is a lot there. And we wanted to know, hey, are people using these? And if so, how effective are they? And how can they be made more effective? And so uh, we wanted to set up this, uh, this seminar series to increase the ability for people to network among themselves and touch on key topics that everyone is so interested in. So this is the first one. We are going to be having them monthly and uh, on the second uh, Thursday of each month, going now through October at the least, and we'll evaluate at that point and see if we should keep going. Um, but this is our first one, and it's very, very exciting, and it is being recorded, and we will make it available to everybody uh, after uh, the fact. I'm going to paste the toolkit into the chat below. Um, it is there now. Oops, nope, that was just to the panelists. Hang on. Mm -hmm. Everyone. Doing it again. There you go. Now it, it, it should be out there. So you can access that and read along. Um, if you have not seen it before, it is there for you now. Um, and I'm so, so thrilled to uh, introduce the speakers that we have today. Uh, Rebecca Snyder from the Oklahoma City Zoo and Lily Maynard from the Cincinnati Zoo, uh, two uh, mega contributors to uh, monarch conservation in general and obviously to safe monarchs. So uh, let me uh, pass it over to them. Um, and I will be here helping gather questions and moderating, moderating the question and answer that we have after the fact. So if you have questions along the way, uh, feel uh, free, please, to put them into the, the Q&A and we will address those after the fact. We should have lots and lots of time for you know uh, interaction and question and answer after the presentations. Uh, take it away, Rebecca. Thank you so much, Zach. So I am really excited to be here with you all today and to kick off this great webinar series. This is the first of eight. So we're going to be talking about the Play It Safe for Monarchs campaign toolkit. Um, and first of all, we wanted to gather some information about how familiar you are with the toolkit. So we have a question that Zach is going to put up that we'd like your responses to. First question is, how familiar are you with the Play It Safe for Monarchs toolkit? So if you could please answer that. Okay, so we've got the results up here. Uh, looks like um, we actually have pretty um, even representative representation across these different categories, but looks like um, most people who responded have looked at it but haven't used it. But we do have 20% of people that have used at least part of it or 20% where the organization has used more than one part of it. So that's really exciting. And a few people who've never heard of it or have heard of it but haven't looked at it. So. We're really hoping that um, you know by uh, attending this webinar, if you haven't used it or if you've looked at it and haven't used it, that um, we can make you more comfortable and, and uh, get you to use it. So we have a second question. So for those of you who have used it, which part of the Play It Safe for Monarchs toolkit have you used? All right, results here. Okay, so most people over half, I haven't used the toolkit yet, but I'd like to use it this spring. So that's very exciting. So you're in the right place. We're gonna share uh, all the resources that are in it with you and um, hopefully then you'll feel really comfortable um, sharing it. Looks like for those of you who have used it, the key messages have been useful. About a third of the folks have used that. 
A third of the folks have used the social media examples and some other folks have used the ideas and the resources that are provided. So that's great. Thank you all so much for participating in that. And I would also encourage you uh, to share with us in the chat or in the question and answer session, what we could add to the toolkit that's missing now that would be useful to you because we really want to gather ideas for additional resources that you'd like us to include so it can be as useful as possible. So um, one thing to know about the toolkit, I'm trying to advance slides and it doesn't want me to for some reason. Hmm. It always works in rehearsal and then not, okay, here we go. <laughs> so one thing you should know about the toolkit is that there are two versions of it. So there's one for spring and another for fall. As we all know, monarchs are moving north in the spring and reproducing along the way. So that's a great time to engage your communities in taking actions for monarchs. And the toolkit provides information about the timing of the migration. So you can see there, it is broken up by the Eastern population, all the monarchs east of the Rockies and the Western population. So all the ones west of the Rockies. And it gives you some um, more detailed information in the toolkit about as when those um, populations start moving out of their overwintering grounds and when you're gonna start seeing them in different parts of the country. So below 40 degrees north, um, monarchs are moving out of the overwintering sites in Mexico now for the Eastern population. And so they're starting to move into Texas. And so March and April is a good time to start sharing with your audiences um, information about how they can take action for monarchs. And then above 40 North, um, you, you're gonna start seeing monarchs more towards April and May. So that's a good time for you to kick off your messaging. And west of the, Mar of the Rockies, the Western monarchs are now leaving their overwintering sites in California as well. So March, April and beyond. Of course, you don't have to stop sharing what people can do um, at the end of spring. You can keep sharing throughout the summer. Um, for a lot of you, monarchs are gonna be in your states during the summer and breeding. So it's good to keep talking about them and keep encouraging people to plant for them. Uh, and then we have a fall version of the uh, toolkit as well, which we update each year and we will send that out in August. Uh, the fall migration, of course, is another great time to engage your audiences and share actions they can take to help monarchs. So the fall toolkit, just like the spring one, has information broken up by population and where you are in the country uh, so that you can um, message at the appropriate time. You can also use Journey North and the Western Monarch Milkweed Mapper to track both the spring and fall migrations to pinpoint your messaging each year. So of course the overall goal is to mobilize your communities to take actions to help monarchs and the toolkit can help you do this. So for both spring and fall, we have the same three primary actions that we're asking people to take. The first is to feed the migration. The second is to reduce threats. And the third is to contribute to community science. So more specifically, we're asking people to feed the migration by planting milkweed and early blooming plants in the spring and late blooming plants in the fall. But of course you can encourage planting throughout the growing season in your area. Uh, to reduce threats, we are asking people to plant pesticide free plants and to plant native milkweed rather than planting uh, tropical milkweed. We are also asking people to enjoy watching monarchs outdoors um, instead of rearing them indoors. And there are many important community science projects around monarchs, so we're asking people to help gather data for those projects. The toolkit includes links to compelling visuals that promote each of these actions. Um, thank you to the staff at the Santa Barbara Zoo for creating these. They are available in a variety of sizes so that you can use them for social media or print them to use for posters and bookmarks. You're welcome to add your own logo to these and use them how you like. Um, the sizes can be adjusted. So please let us know what you need and we can ask the generous folks at Santa Barbara Zoo to create that for you. The toolkit also has sample social media messages and suggested hashtags and emojis. And here you can see a post from the new zoo in Adventure Park where they added their own logo to the visual. 
and they encourage their followers to plant pesticide-free plants. Do we have anybody with us from the new zoo and adventure park? If so, please let us know in the chat. And thank you so much for using the toolkit to mobilize your audience to help monarchs. Okay, the toolkit also provides suggestions for events that you can host to encourage your guests to take direct action. So we're really fortunate that this is pretty easy to do for monarchs compared to many of the other species that zoos and aquariums support. It's actually possible for the average person to create habitat for monarchs, which is of course much more difficult for most other species. So one suggestion in the toolkit is to host a native plant sale. And here you can see an example from the Topeka Zoo and Conservation Center, which held this pollinator palooza plant sale. Um, this type of event has a lot of benefits. And I think we might have somebody from Topeka Zoo here who can share more about their plant sale with us. Rachel, are you able to join us? I do not see Rachel as one of the attendees, but I will let you know if I see her jump in. Okay, well, she did um, share all these bullet points with me. So they clearly are uh, making the most of their plant sale at the Topeka Zoo. Uh, so there are lots of great opportunities that a plant sale offers to an organization. One is it's just a way for you to get pesticide free plants out into your community. So some communities have a hard time sourcing pesticide free plants. And so it's wonderful if the zoo can provide that, that source of safe plants to the community. It's also an opportunity for your horticulture team or whoever is in charge of plants at your organization to share their expertise with people and maybe to get them out in front of the public if that's not something that um, they regularly are able to do. Uh, those folks are also great about teaching the community how and why to plant. Uh, so planting pollinator plants is pretty easy and they're pretty easy to maintain but it's still great to teach the community um, where to plant and how to maintain their gardens after, after they're planted. Um, at Topeka Zoo, Rachel told me that they both sell plants ahead of the sale online, and then they also sell plants in person the day of the sale. So that helps them to um, increase the number of plants that they, they are able to sell. She said they also sell zoo produced honey. So that's another great message that you can share um, about how the plants are important for bees as well as the monarchs. Um, they partner with their local school district for bee houses. So that's a great partnership. Um, they also promote citizen science butterfly classes um, at their zoo and as part of their plant sale. And all of their proceeds from the plant sale go to their conservation fund, which is a great way to raise money. Um, some zoos um, also sell zoo produced co compost. And so having a plant sale is a great chance to talk about compost and your zoo's efforts um, to be more sustainable and compost uh, waste that you're producing and how great that can be for the garden. Uh, Tobiko Zoo said they host their um, plant sale the Saturday before Mother's Day. So that's a great um, thing to do for the family before Mother's Day. And obviously this is a way to attract media attention too, because this headline was from a local uh, paper. So lots of things that you can accomplish um, all in one go with a plant sale. Um, another suggestion from the toolkit is to host a pollinator planting event at your zoo. So my zoo, the Oklahoma City Zoo has done this a few times. We've done it for our fall Monarch Festival and we did it in 2019 for AZA's Party for the Planet spring into action campaign. So every time we've done this, it's actually been a huge hit with guests. We've been pleasantly surprised every time we've done it, how many people are um, really excited to come to the zoo and help us plant a pollinator garden at the zoo. As part of the activity, we ask guests to pledge to help monarchs um, and we collect their email addresses with that pledge so that we can follow up with them with a survey for more information. There is a um, pledge uh, form in the toolkit. So if you don't have your own, you can definitely um, use the link in the toolkit to uh, pull up that pledge form and use that if you want to take advantage of that. Um, we also give out free milkweed to um, our guests who pledge uh, to help monarchs and help us plant. And that is a great way to attract people to, um, to do this with us. Um, and then we also partner with local conservation groups who table at the event to give it more of a festival feel and, and allow our partners to share information as well. 
So I have a video that we created. So in 2019, AZA for their Party for the Planet event, um, they held a uh, uh, sponsored a video contest and we entered our event in that video contest. So I'm going to show you that video. We actually got second place for it and we received $10,000 to donate to a conservation project. And we um, donated that to our statewide um, uh, monarch conservation organization, which is the Oklahoma Monarch and Pollinator Collaborative, which the zoo helped to found and is a part of. So I hope this will play. <laughs> we'll see. Seems like maybe it's thinking about it. Here we go. So this year, the Oklahoma City Zoo really embraced AZA's Spring Into Action initiative by hosting our own Planting for Pollinators event in celebration of Earth Day and Party for the Planet. We asked our guests and community members to partner with us to plant a new pollinator garden here at the zoo. We had over 600 guests help us plant milkweed and native nectar plants. In total, they planted over 676 plants. The entire community and conservation organizations that we partner with year-round had an opportunity to help us communicate why planting for pollinators is important for creating healthy ecosystems. And we're really, really fortunate to have a female monarch visit, and she was actually laying eggs on the milkweed as we were planting them. So that really got kids and guests excited about helping us. Whoops. <laughs> I don't want it to go to a bunch of YouTube stuff. Hang on one second. Let me try to get out of that. I think I'm going to have to escape from the slideshow for a second to get it to move on to the next slide. There we go. Um, so the I think the reason that uh, that we were able to do so well with that video was definitely because of the magic of that uh, monarch butterfly coming and laying eggs during the event. Um, obviously, you can't uh, make that happen, but we were just really lucky that she did that, and um, we were actually able to show kids the um, the butterflies eggs on the bottoms of the leaves of the milkweed plants and then ask us if they would help us plant those so the caterpillars would have something to eat and so we got tremendous um, enthusiasm from kids from that so that was amazing. And then um, when we do these planting events, uh, we typically follow up a few weeks after the event. We send out a short survey. It's just six questions long to those who took the pledge to find out if they took action. So you can see the results from one of our surveys here. Um, this one was after one of our fall monarch festivals. Um, so questions were, did you plant the, the free milkweed we gave you? And 93% of the people responded that they did. Um, we also asked them if they planted any nectar plants along with the milkweed and 63% of folks said that they did. Um, we also ask if pe why people didn't plant, um, and uh, one reason because we hold this in the fall is that lots of people think fall is too late to plant, so that's a chance for us to um, do more education on that <clears throat> topic. We also ask them uh, if they used the information card that we gave them, which explains um, how to plant, and 72% of respondents said that they did use that. And then we asked them if they plan to plant nectar and milkweed plants in the spring and 91% of folks responded that they did. So of course we've been really happy with these results. It's a way for us to measure how many people were reaching and then, but then also measure if they actually took action after the event, which I think we all know can be hard to do with these events. Okay, now I am gonna, whoops, I went too far. Now I'm going to turn it over to Lily Maynard, who's uh, Director of Global Conservation at the City Cincinnati Zoo and Botanical Gardens, and ask her to talk about the great work that the Cincinnati Zoo is doing to benefit pollinators. Thanks so much, Rebecca. I'm excited to be here and connect with you all. All of our safe monarch network across the continent is really energizing and exciting to me. I'm uh, excited to hear how people apply the toolkits this year and also where, where we can fill in more information on the toolkits. 
Thanks for showing us that video, Rebecca. I was inspired by the visuals of your kids planting plants. I'm here with our education manager, my friend Sarah Navarro, and we were both just talking about how we wish our horticulture team would let kids plant in our garden. So now we have evidence that look how great it is. Let's um, get more kids in putting their hand in the dirt and, and contributing. And it definitely doesn't hurt to have a female monarch come and bless it and say thank you and say, this is for me right there. One way that we um, work hard around um, promoting monarch conservation and pollinators is our events here at the zoo. In addition to Party for the Planet and around Earth Day, we here at Cincinnati Zoo uh, have two different car week-long carnival events, and which, which has uh, social media messages and some events leading up to the big event on a Saturday. So that's what you can see the dates here. We're in June around Pollinator Week. We have part Pollinator Carnival. And then in October, we have our Monarch Festival where you can see people dress up. The kids' costumes are amazing. We've had costume competitions. Uh, we have a huge kind of on stilts big flapping wings of monarchs that lead the parade and our zoo teams are really actively involved in making the whole zoo a space to celebrate monarchs using chalk to make all of the different locations and barriers that monarchs might face in their migration on the pathways in the zoo. So whether it's crossing mountains or rivers or identifying specific states as they go along in their corridors and cross the border into Mexico, because we're on the eastern range of monarchs. So we our, our teams are really excited and several of them have even said it's their favorite part of the year. And for them to say that over other things they might do in their personal lives or holidays they might celebrate, it's really exciting for us to have these opportunities to invite people to come in, dress up and celebrate. And then we do similar things like have vendors from local businesses, have plant sales from our nurseries and our horticulture team to answer questions, uh, similar to what Rebecca was sharing, but to really rally people to celebrate and then connect that into the social media content from the toolkits is really useful. And so you can see how that really multiplies our reach beyond the people who come to the event itself. We can also reach and spread the word to all of our viewers and audience members who pay attention to our zoos but might not be always located in proximity and visit us on that day. We can go to the next slide. And so what want to highlight a couple other key features of the toolkit where we really want you and want to encourage any safe monarch partner to provide clear and useful resources around what plants are from your region that can be easy to plant and are the right ones to plant in that region. Also, you have a really great point there, Rebecca. Sometimes there's misconceptions about what time of year is the right time to plant. People say, oh, I plant in the spring, but milkweed, most of the time you need to plant in the fall so that it gets cold, it feels that cold, and then you can plant it um, in the fall so that then it will grow in the spring. If it's springtime like now, I've learned, and I'm not a horticulture expert, but I've learned you can trick the milkweed in, in a refrigerator or different things like that. I would definitely recommend looking up instructions, not just listening to me, but there's information in the toolkit about that. And we really want to encourage everyone that is a pa partner with Safe Monarchs to provide relevant resources to your audiences for your region. Because that's what we are. We are a trusted resource for our communities of this information. And we can really invite people to take action and show them how simple it is. Like those amazing images of kids planting those plants in Oklahoma. That's inspiring and makes me want to get out and plant more too. <laughs> and one more. We've got also a really great feature um, that comes from our partners at Monarch Joint Venture. Katie Lynn Bunny is on this call as well. Uh, the 10 different types of community science projects that we really want to highlight as ways people can get involved in studying monarchs, helping us monitor their health, and be able to celebrate when interventions work. 
when all of this great gardening effort and reduction in pesticide efforts and all of those threats are addressed, we want to be able to also monitor the health and the size of monarch populations to be able to know if it's working or ways or areas we might need to improve. And in order to do that, there's a variety of ways that we can crowdsource and invite every person that comes into our zoo and aquarium gates and every person that follows us on social media or I harass my friends and family to get involved too. you know, you can do it all to think about ways that you can get involved. And so uh, for a spring migration, here's four example projects that you can promote. There's Journey North, which it has a very clear name about how monitoring how they journey north, but they it's also they don't only focus on monarchs, but that's one of their key species. But it's really interesting because you can also explore their maps of other species as well if you want to get nerdy and it's always fun to look at a little data. Um, the monarch larva monitoring project is specifically for looking at the larva or the caterpillars. So whenever you find a caterpillar. It's an easy way to help record some data and help us know where monarchs are thriving. Project Monarch Help uh, is one that will help us monitor the infection of monarchs with a parasite that makes them sick or confused and is a major issue. And it's led by a team at University of Georgia. And so there's an opportunity there to help us monitor their health. And lastly, if you're located out west, Western Monarch Milkweed Mapper, which is a fun series of words, uh, is a way for monitoring all of the different locations of milkweed because the Western population west of the Rockies has been in dire straits in recent years, though thank goodness we had better counts this winter in our overwintering sites. But that doesn't mean we give up and declare victory. We need to monitor where there is milkweed and maybe where there's spaces where we could plant some milkweed out west. And so if you are located out there, we definitely encourage you to look at Western Monarch Milkweed Mapper. And I saw that Katie Lynn um, posted in the chat that the Milkweed Mapper trainings are coming up this spring. And so you can click that link and sign up there. And MLMP trainings for the Monarch Larva Monitoring Project. Thank you. Sorry, I just wanted to keep talking about Milkweed Mapper. <laughs> <laughs> so that's relevant. Katie Lynn, while you're on, while you're chatting, what, that's located for both Eastern and Western, right? Yes, MLMP is both East and West. For the Western Monarch Milkweed Mapper, they're also doing their Western Monarch Milkweed Challenge right now um, for, you know, mapping out where monarchs and, and milkweed are. So if you're in a Western state, you can look into getting involved in that. I'll drop a link in the chat in a moment. Great. Thank you, Katie Lynn. And I want to highlight, I, I know that you've been hearing me say it, we really emphasize community science as the key term because we want to invite anyone that is in our community to participate and take citizenship out of the equation. And not uh, though it might not be a part of anybody's process when we do citizen science, and that's more of the traditional common term, but we're seeing more and more trends to focus on community science in order to make sure we're welcoming and not um, putting up any barriers for people. And so just wanted to explicitly explain that for anybody who might be wondering why I'm not using the term citizen science. And that's because anybody who's here, even if they're just visiting our zoo or aquarium as a tourist, we want to welcome them in and invite them to help us collect some science, help us monitor our monarchs and be a part of monarch conservation. So want to emphasize that for you all to think about how we can all together work together to be inclusive of our communities and promote monarchs because they inspire everybody. Thanks so much. That's the last slide, I believe, right, Rebecca? Yeah, that's right. Thank you so much, Lily. I'm actually going to stop sharing now so that uh, I can at least see everyone better. Um, and we would be happy to take questions. Thanks so much, everybody. That was fantastic. Thank you so much. Um, and yeah, if you have questions, uh, you can put them in the Q and A. Um, you can also raise your hand, and I can unmute you if you would like to have a dialogue. Um, either way, uh, either way works. 
Um, and then also just a, a reminder that, that this is being recorded, so we will send it out to everybody. Um, it seems as though there was a challenge where some people were, were not able to join, which is unfortunate, but luckily it is being recorded, so we'll be able to send it around to everybody um, after the fact for those that were not able to make it in. And it's really exciting that this is just the first of many opportunities and conversations. Lots of exciting topics coming up uh, throughout the year and every, the next few months, right? Absolutely. <laughs> So as, as uh, questions start to come in, I have a question for you. Um, and th this, is, this is going to be addressed as a deep dive in a future one, but it, it came, it, you know, it is relevant in the materials that I saw you presenting on. So my mom has, lives part-time here in Florida. She just went back home to Utah. And so she came over and she dropped off all of her plants for me to watch for for her while she's away. And she dropped off five giant tropical milkweed plants <laughs> what do I do? I'm going to let, let uh, Katie Lynn take that one. <laughs> <laughs> what we do in Oklahoma is different than what you're going to do in Florida. And mm -hmm. so I'm going to let Katie Lynn field that. But we do, it is a great um, introduction to the fact that we do have a webinar coming up to address exactly this topic because it is. Kind of um, a tricky one, depending on what part of the country you live in. Um, we are going to be talking about, I think that's in May, right, is native versus tropical milkweed, um, the do's and don'ts of that tricky issue. So Katie Lynn, I'll let you answer that. Yeah, thank you. Um, hi, everybody. I don't think I've introduced myself yet. I'm Katie Lynn. I'm with the Monarch Joint Venture. Um, so I'm not part of a zoo or an aquarium. I am a, a, a non-AZA partner that sits on the steering committee for this group. Um, and if you're not familiar with MJV, I'm presenting next week on a you know, big picture overview of monarch conservation. So I'll talk a little bit about MJV and what we do and then give you guys the big picture of, of how monarch safe fits in with all of that as well. But to answer your question, Zach, um, since you're in, you're in Orlando, right? That's correct. Yeah. So the general consensus is that tropical milkweed is probably native or at least close enough to native <laughs> south of Orlando, like Orlando and south. So you're probably fine. Um, for those of you who are in a Gulf Coast state or a state where tropical milkweed um, has either naturalized or does not die back or go dormant in the winter, um, the recommendation, and generally that's anywhere north of Orlando, Florida, uh, the recommendation is to cut back the milkweed from October to February or March um, to mimic what native milkweeds would be doing at that time of year. Native milkweeds in most of those areas go dormant during the winter months, um, so monarchs don't encounter them. Um, that said, I know that doesn't sit well with everybody. I know not everybody wants to cut their milkweed back sometimes because there's monarchs on it or because you don't have other milkweeds available. Um, so along with cutting milkweed back, work towards replacing tropical milkweed with native species. And you can look up what those are um, and we can provide some resources as well. I think there's some in the toolkit actually. Um, but work towards replacing tropical milkweed with native milkweeds. And um, as, as your native milkweed garden grows, you can slowly remove the tropical milkweed as, um, as needed. Um, Katie Lynn, does that mean Zach needs to replace his mom's plants when then when he gives it back to you? <laughs> no, but he can, you know, gently suggest a different species when she gets back. Um, but like I said, like Orlando is probably fine. If you have tropical milkweed in Orlando, it's probably fine. But what you could do, Zach, is order some kits from Project Monarch Health and test any butterflies that you get for OE. Um, uh, on the milkweed plants this summer because that could be a really interesting thing especially because it sounds like they're potted right they don't um they're not in the ground obviously because she brought they're them potted the I'm I'm looking at them right now that's actually yeah. why I came to mind because I'm I'm looking at them through the window <laughs> <laughs> yeah so um you could also report any monarchs that you see to any of those other community science programs um even MLMP you could do potted plants with MLMP um and for those of you who are curious about when, what MLMP is, I can talk about that next week. Also, I'll give a brief overview about what some of those are again. Um, but in general for MLMP, 
We recommend having at least 10 plants, but you don't need 10 plants. All data are useful. All data still provide information to the population, especially in situations like your Zach, where they're not like in the ground. It's, it's a potted plant garden, um, which I think is interesting because we're seeing more and more of those types of gardens in urban areas for pollinators because that's all the space that's available for pollinator gardens in some cases. So um, having those data for potted plants on milkweed is actually really useful. Perfect. Thank you so much. And I'm sorry to, to uh, go off on a tangent. The reason yeah. I asked actually was was a, it was a twofold. Um, one was, yeah, it's a question that I know that a lot of people have and to plug an upcoming uh, seminar, but also, you know, I, I wish that I could make it to the Topeka Zoo's native plant sale and um, get some of these other native milkweeds. And I wanted to make sure that, uh, you know, there was a way to, to plug that. Um, but, uh, but I do have another question re relevant to the, the toolkits. Um, so this is a, you know, a question that came up is there were a lot of people based on those survey results that uh, have not used the toolkits yet. Um, but there was a lot of people that are interested in using it this spring. Um, and, um, you know, I think that was fantastic that in your answer, uh, Katie Lynn, you were very regionally specific, and that's true within the toolkits. There's a lot of regionally specific parts in there because a lot of the questions that people have are complicated, and they take, you know, there's, you know, there's, you know, timing and, uh, uh, you know, phenological and geographical nuance to it all. Um, and I just wanted to highlight that that is uh, baked into the toolkits, and there is useful information in there. But if I am a, in a position where, you know, I haven't used it at all yet, but I would like to, you know, what would you say is the easiest way? What, what, you know, what would be the easiest thing to take out of it um, and use right away? What, what could I just like on a dime, turn around and, and access and utilize, would you say? Um, well, I'll start with <laughs> answering this and then I welcome um, Lily and Katie Lynn to join in. But I think the social media messaging is really easy to do. So the visuals are right there for you. You could put your own logo on it if you want to. And there are actually written out sample messages. So whichever one of those appeals to you, I think that's the simplest way to start. And um, we're pretty lucky usually all of our zoos and aquariums tend to have good following by our communities. And so that's just a way to broadcast to a lot of people, hey, the monarchs are coming, it's spring, and here's some things you can do to help them. And hopefully makes them curious um, to find out more information, right? You can always, always direct them to more sources of information. So that's my recommendation of easiest way to get started. I completely concur. And if I can build on that, I would say that the toolkits also have a lot of great information, talking points and details that are resources that you can hand to your coworkers and staff in a variety of departments at your zoos and aquariums. Not only your education department or the horticulture department might be interested, but if, we, if you reach out to people all over your staff and you say, we're part of Safe Monarchs and we're celebrating the migration that's coming, take a look at some of these talking points and celebrate when you happen to be walking around and you see a monarch or you see somebody looking at a garden. That's, there's an opportunity to empower our staff to come together around this celebration and rather than having it be siloed in certain departments. And then the messages can really care, spread beyond the individual teams that might be on this call to really help everybody be excited and help spread the word. Yep, I totally agree with both of those. I don't, I don't have anything to add. Um, other than if you have questions on some of that, you know, where to start or some of that regionally specific stuff, you can always reach out to us. We can, we can help talk through some things with you if you, if you need that sort of extra ear. Sometimes even just talking through the ideas, you solve it on your own, um, and we're happy to be that sort of rubber duck <laughs> for you um, if, if you need just like a, a passive ear to, to talk to. Katie Lynn's really good at that. I've leaned on her many a time. So thank you, Katie Lynn. Uh, and I'll also share, respond to the great comment from Jen around emphasizing monarchs and how we storytell around monarch conservation is a DEAI initiative, is an opportunity for us to be inclusive and emphasize diversity in, re in recognizing it's a species that goes to Mexico and is a key part of Mexican culture. And so there's opportunity of storytelling there. Another layer I would add based on what Katie Lynn was saying earlier around 
collecting data from milkweeds and pollinator gardens and flower pots, we can be inclusive of people no matter what access or resources that they have, because monarch conservation can be impacted by literally anyone. Uh, Zach and I worked on a project in the past where it didn't matter how big the garden was, it didn't, even if it was in a flower pot, from a pollinator's perspective, that's food and they're excited. And so uh, another way to really keep that in DEAI in mind in our storytelling and as we promote monarch conservation, I'm trying to train myself to not use the word backyard because that's assuming somebody owns a house and has access to the yard, a big yard and has control over the space to be able to change it and build a, build a big pollinator garden. But instead saying, you can put a flower pot on your doorstep or your windowsill or get involved via our zoo and aquariums through events in our communities and be more inclusive of people and rather than only inviting people who have more access to resources. So I wanted to build on that, Jen. Absolutely. Yeah. And if I could just build on that even just a little bit more, those are all such fantastic points. Um, and one of the really nice opportunities, I would say, with, with you know, butterflies in general, and, but particularly monarchs, because they mean so much to so many people, is um, you know, the travel costs can, be, um, can really inhibit some, some of these outreach opportunities um, or community engagement opportunities. But the nice thing is with the butterflies, they'll come and find you. Um, and to your point, uh, Lily and everybody else, you, know, you, you don't need a lot of space. It doesn't matter if you're in a high rise or you know, wherever. Where, wherever you are, you might be able to create some habitat. Um, and so you don't need a lot of space because these animals will find it and smell it and look for it and come find you. So you don't have to transport people far away. The wildlife comes to you, which is such an amazing thing to see and so empowering. Um, and so, uh, yeah, that's, it's just a really nice thing there. And then, and likewise, you know, there are some people that really, for other reasons, can't travel. And so, you know, there, I've been involved in other projects to say, see if you can add pollinator habitats to children's hospitals or other areas where people might not have access and might really value seeing that nature come and come and visit them. So I think that's such an important part of, of, uh, you know, nature, it's the, the role that nature plays in people's lives more broadly, but such a phenomenal opportunity with monarch butterflies. So we had a question come in. It's a bit of a topic shift and it's a sticky wicket. We'll see how you guys feel about this one. Sort of, kind of. Uh, any recommendations on how to change or stop rearing practices of monarch enthusiasts? Um, I know that this is one that people have very strong uh, feelings about. Um, uh, I would love to open it up for discussion if, uh, if, if anybody is, is willing. Go for it, Katie Lynn. <laughs> I've already got my answer ready. Um, I'm going to put a resource in the chat um, from Monarch Joint Venture. We just updated this recently. Um, and I want to start by saying that there's disagreement on this, um, even within the scientific community. However, Monarch Joint Venture stance is what's in that handout there. Um, and essentially what it boils down to is that if you are going to be raising monarch butterflies, for whatever initial reason, you also need to be, should be reporting them to a community science project. And that can be any of the ones that we've talked about previously. And then another point that we emphasize is that raising monarchs is not considered a best practice for conservation or to increase the population. Um, you know, I, I think a lot of people look at endangered species, particularly other insects or small animals like the Wyoming toad or, um, you know, breeding programs that happen at AZA institutions and think that that's an appropriate practice for monarch butterflies, but we're not there yet. Um, and actually doing that could be more harmful to the population than helpful. Um, as the person who referenced um, the parasite problem from a new paper study done from uh, Project Monarch Health about parasites being more prevalent now than they have been in the past, um, possibly due to practices of rearing. So it, it's good to keep an eye on the science. It's good to um, also know that there are lots of opinions and even within the scientific community on this, even within MJV's partnership, there are varying thoughts on it. Um, <laughs> I know that other people on the, the steering committee for the Safe Monarch Group um, 
have experienced that too. So if people are wanting to raise monarchs, they should be reporting them to a community science program and generally keeping it to a small number. Um, you know, I know a lot of monarch enthusiasts are raising hundreds, if not thousands of butterflies. And that's where it gets really worrying that practices aren't um, up to par for like husbandry reasons and things like that. Um, there are disease concerns, there's genetic diversity concerns, there's um, whether or not monarchs in the fall will be able to orient themselves for the migration if they're released. Um, and there's just, there's so much that we don't know about rearing and the practices and the effects on monarchs um, that at, for me personally, at least it makes me a little nervous that like we shouldn't mess with it, right? Um, so use that resource as a, as a guide. Um, and as you're talking with people about it, um, be careful of your tone and your, um, I guess, presence, right? And I see Lily and Rebecca nodding with me because they've experienced this too, right? You don't want to come off as accusatory or as a, as thinking like, oh, you're doing that? That's way wrong. You shouldn't be doing that. Like, don't, don't steamroll them into this sort of thing. Just kind of get on their level and see why they're raising monarchs and then gently offer alternatives um, or corrections to what their thought processes are. Because if we, as we've seen in recent years, um, you know, steamrolling people with, with our own opinions and our own thoughts in science and, and things like that um, can actually have the opposite effect and they'll dig their heels in further and keep doing things the way they've been doing them. Um, and I'll also end by saying, I raise monarchs in my home every summer, but I don't do more than five at a time. And I don't raise monarchs that will be part of the migratory generation. And every monarch that I raise is also reported to the Monarch Larva Monitoring Project. I collect data for their survival. Um, and then I also test all of my monarchs for OE during the summer as well. So um, that's just on a personal level. And then whatever monarchs I'm raising personally just sometimes happen to come with me to events and workshops and things like that. So I don't raise any extra ones for those things. Uh, but I'm also not a zoo. <laughs> I have that luxury. I know that zoos and aquariums have different programs than I do. So. Katie Lynn, if you were if you were located in California, would you be able to to do that? No. Thank you for bringing that up. No, in California, um, it you need a scientific collection permit to collect any invertebrate in California, including monarchs. And right now, the California Department of Fish and Wildlife is not issuing any scientific collection permits for monarchs, except in a few very rare like research cases to to scientists. Um, so if you're in California and you're raising monarchs you shouldn't be. <laughs> um, so if you want to do participate, if you want to participate in Monarch Community Science in California, there are other programs that you can do, including the MLMP, um, observational programs like MLMP and Western Monarch Milkweed Mapper and um, Journey North programs like that. You just can't bring monarchs in to raise them. Um, and I'll, I want to note too that when monarchs are listed under the Endangered Species Act, which is expected in 2024, it's entirely possible that a similar ruling will come down when the legislation is written that nobody will be able to raise monarchs. Um, it's also possible that there will be some exceptions to that, like for community science, but we won't know what those will be until that happens. And that's, you know, two years down the road, at least. So just prepare yourselves for that eventuality of not being able to raise monarchs at all because that's like po a, a possible scenario. Thanks so much Katie Lynn for emphasizing so much expertise around the process and your personal story of how you can still have that connection and still have that educational value but with an intentional limitation of five at a time and a lot of detailed process that you, that you follow. So thank you for modeling that for us. Uh, I just wanted to jump, jump in and chime in around the process of how we decided what fits in the Safe Monarch program plan and what doesn't. You have, those of you who are all, you're all likely partners in Safe Monarch, so you know that raising monarch butterflies is not one of the activities that we promote 
as an organizational activity that people can do to help conservation of monarchs because we follow that science that Katie Lynn walked us through and we follow the advice of great experts like Katie Lynn representing Monarch Joint Venture. And so there might be a few zoos and aquariums who are partners with us in the network who choose or have in the past done that process. But just like Katie Lynn said, how we are modeling and are being inclusive and not steamrolling people and telling people stop doing that and or vilifying in our language. We want to encourage everyone who's passionate about monarchs to continue to be passionate. And if it means you are passionate because you love and have enjoyed the experience of being up close with monarchs as they go through their metamorphosis, it is awe inspiring. Of course it is. But if we can invite people to see the alternative ways that you can redirect our awe towards impactful actions that we can do to really help reduce the threats to monarchs, rather than contributing in ways that feel good of releasing individuals and saying, hooray, more in the world, without knowing the negative consequences of disease or disorientation. That's what we're here for. We're here to redirect and help emphasize impact. And I'm just so excited about the potential our huge network has in this effort to really get more impact for monarchs. So thanks everybody for joining us in that initiative. And thank you to whoever asked about the sometimes tricky question of yeah. Uh, yep. The other thing I'll add to that, um, when MJD does events in person um, and we have live monarchs, we always make sure we're modeling best practices for keeping those monarchs, which means they're all in individual containers as caterpillars and pupae. Um, and they're also in a mesh container as adults with milkweed and nectar, pl nectar plants so that they can feed and rest on things that aren't a mesh container. And we include a little like sign a disclaimer that says all of these monarchs are wild caught and they're all re being reported to these programs um, for more information and then we give them our handout or link to our website so everybody who encounters them you know sees that sign and we always talk about it you know we're very open with like why we do that and 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 what our practices are Thank you so much. That's all fantastic information. And um, just one more tiny thing to add is that, you know, monarchs are such a unique species and, you know, the, the science is evolving and opinions on this are evolving. Um, there are other species where there are very uh, important conservation projects that do involve uh, captive rearing and release like the Miami blue or the Shouse of Swallowtail or others, um, but monarchs are such a unique case. Um, and, uh, but yeah, and it's all coming from a place of love and passion and desire for their conservation. So. I really appreciate what you said about, you know, being tactful um, in, uh, you know, communicating these points. Fantastic. Well, we only have five minutes left. If we have uh, any more questions, uh, we could probably take one more question. Uh, if anybody out there is uh, been waiting, thinking, oh, man, should I? Should I? Yes. The answer is you should. And now is the time. Otherwise, uh, I think we can uh, we can wrap it up. So uh, thank you so much, everybody, for joining us. I am absolutely thrilled um, to uh, to have uh, you know initiated this seminar series. I think it is such a fantastic way to get people connected and to share the success stories. Um, Rachel Rost was one of the folks that was not able to get in for whatever reason. So that is a problem that needs to be solved. I know I don't understand uh, why. It, Zoom would not let her in. And so we've got some uh, IT uh, things to look into. Um, and there, there were several people that unfortunately were not able to, to make it in. And I don't totally understand why, but I will look into that. Um, and uh, we will share out the recording of it so people can uh, participate um, in that way. And we will try to, to, uh, to fix that going forward so that everybody can, can come in and be a part of it. Um, but we'll always record it and we'll always post it so that people can uh, you know, keep this alive. Um, and then just a reminder that the next session is going to be on April 14th, uh, led by uh, Katie Lynn from Monarch Joint Venture. And that is going to be a deep dive into monarch conservation highlights, getting up to speed with the science and uh, you know, disentangling all the you know the crazy nuance with a species that spans the entire continent and and uh, flies across borders and you know does all sorts of amazing stuff. 
So thank you so much for joining us and massive, massive thank you to uh, Rebecca, Lily, uh, and Katie Lynn uh, for uh, all of your contributions to this. Um, and uh, I will be posting this soon and we will see you next time. Thank you so much. Mm-hmm.